Ya, así que en teoría estamos, estamos al sí. aire, o sea, estamos sí, al aire ahora. Estamos al aire. Espérate, justo me escribió Pablo. De... Ya, vamos a empezar, porque son las... Tú estás en la oficina, ¿cierto? Ahí en... Sí. Ya, buenísimo. Tengo cable red. Son las seis y media de la tarde. Súper. Así que... Empezamos nomás. ¿En qué? Voy a ver, chequear YouTube, que esté funcionando y... Eh... Estamos. ¿Por qué no me salen? Porque estoy chequeando que en YouTube se esté transmitiendo. Y... Dicuchile.cl. Dicuchile.cl. Sí, ahí estamos. Estamos transmitiendo. Así que empecemos abajo. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our last webinar on water resources and environment here at Universidad de Chile. Uh, my name is Nicolás Vázquez, a PhD student in the civil engineering program at Universidad de Chile. And today uh, we have Felipe Saavedra. Felipe Saavedra is a PhD student in the catchment uh, hydrology department at the Helmsholt Center for Environmental Research in Germany since 2020. He completed his undergraduate studies at Universidad de Chile where the main topic were hydrological cycle in forested, cut, in forested catchments and snow dynamics in the central Andes. Uh, his current research is focused on large sample catchment hydrology, particularly understanding the impacts of anthropogenic landscape modification on the water quality of rivers under different hydrological conditions. So uh, thank you, Felipe, for accepting our invitation. Um, the title of Felipe's work is Effects of hydrological events on nitrate mobilization and delivery in river German and German river catchments. Um, so before uh, you start, I would like to remind the audience that you can ask your questions in the YouTube chat. Um, so if there if there's any comment or question, uh, just write it in the chat and we can ask Felipe later after his presentation. And, and that's it. I guess. So uh, thanks again, Felipe, um, for being with us today. And that's it. This, I think the stage is yours now. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. So now I will share my screen. OK, so this is. So it's, uh, it's working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Well, first. Thanks, Nico and Pablo, for the invitation. I'm, I'm honored to be presenting in this seminar that when I was a student so many times attended. Um, so yeah, thanks for the presentation also, Nico. The topic that I will present today is my PhD project, Effect of Hydrological Events on Nitrate Mobilization uh, in German River Catchments. And uh, so as Nico said, I'm part from Helmholtz Hall Centrum for environmental research. Uh, and at the same time, I'm part of Tracer uh, International School in trajectories of in water security, and also part of the NGO Somosawa in Chile, where we also look at topics related to agriculture practices. And uh, my PhD is in Dynamo project we, uh, with other three PhDs. We are looking at the effects of events in mobilization of nutrients. So um, the list of my, my my main supervisor is Larissa Tarasova, and, uh, but also uh, Andreas Musolf, Ralph Mertz, Jana von Freiberg, and Stefano Basso. And in the picture, you can see, uh, well, I will talk about nitrate. So we want to we wanna know uh, how important is nitrate for our environment? And well, the picture is clear. Uh, for example, here in the top left, we see the eutrophication, alga, algae bloom. Uh, so this is one consequences or one consequence of the excess of nutrients in water bodies 
the death of fishes, for example. This is an episode this year. And uh, in my project, I want to check how uh, this, the dynamics of these nutrients uh, is affected, are affected by hydrological events, for example, here uh, during our runoff events. So high levels of discharge or uh, what happens when we have the opposite, very dry conditions, uh, droughts in this case. But first, uh, well, the contents of this presentation, first is like, I will introduce the problem of nitrate. I want, I want to convince you that this is an important issue worldwide. And then we will look um, at the dynamics of nitrate at catchment scale. How do we anal analyze this? And uh, my two topics that I have analyzed so far is the impact of runoff events in nitrate dynamics and also the impact of hydrological droughts in this nitrate transport. And uh, so first, yes, nitrate is an issue. To start from the beginning, uh, what is nitrate? Uh, nitrate is like a nutrient, as I, as I said, one uh, atom of nitrogen and three of oxygen. And this nutrient is uh, highly required by plants for uh, in farms, for example, and has some properties. Two, uh, two very important ones. One is that it's highly uh, soluble in water. This means that uh, it's very easy to transport uh, with water. And also uh, biodegradability. So it's very highly reactive. So it means that uh, chemical reactions uh, or biochemical reactions are all, can, can also play a role in the dynamics. So th this is why this um, problem is so interesting because this has the two problems that I, I will be mentioned during the presentation, transport and uh, transformation. So the excess of nitrate uh, can be toxic for our aquatic systems producing eutrophication, but also for human consumption. And in the European regulation, the threshold that we, uh, of, for groundwater, um, they want to keep the concentration below 50 milligrams per liter. Um, okay, so first, where are the main sources of nitrate? This is a, like a classical picture, like nitrate comes from different sources. It's important to know which are the main ones. First, we have atmospheric deposition, so interactions between the atmosphere and, uh, and, and the terrestrial uh, environment. We have like fertilization surplus, so the addition of fertilizer to our the, the land and the surplus is we can we can say uh, all this nitrate that the plants didn't consume for the development for creating biomass but also another source is the sept septic systems so uh, water treatment plants and also there are some sources of industrial waste so i i highlighted in the fertilization surplus because uh, in, in Germany, in, in German catchments, is the most important one. So this part of the figure is the um, summarize more, uh, some part of these uh, interactions that are playing a role. So we have the application of fertilizer in the soil. Then you have rainfall or irrigation in some cases. And um, the water will infiltrate, transporting this nitrate. Uh, contaminating groundwater, but also taking faster flow paths, for example, subsurface flow, and bringing this uh, nitrate to the river. So in this plot here, hope it's not too small, we see that from the total uh, amount of, nit of nitrate uh, in our system, most of, of it is it comes from agriculture. We can see like the trends in from uh, uh, maybe more than hundred years ago, and so there's like an increase in this uh, nitrate surplus. So this um, agricultural surplus, which is here in, in the top, is agriculture, and in the bottom is the total. And we see that the shape of this uh, tr trend is exactly the same as agriculture, meaning that uh, agriculture is really the main, uh, uh, the main input for nitrate in, in these catchments. So there have been many efforts, uh, implementations 
for example, in the 90s, uh, 80s also, uh, to reduce uh, the nitrate use. In the past, uh, farmers were applying fertilizers, I mean, under the assumption that if we put more, it will be better for our plants uh, without considering the environmental issues. Then uh, authorities noticed that this, this was an issue and they started applying um, policies to reduce this. But it's not so easy to implement this kind of policies because uh, this will affect farmers and they will not be happy. This is a picture of this year in Netherlands because uh, of after Netherlands trying to implement some policies to reduce the, the leaching of nitrate from, from the farms. So how big is the problem in the world uh, of nitrate? Here you see from different um, continents the use of nitrate fertilizer and it's not improving. If you see this small plot show for the whole world and it has been only increasing. Why it's increasing? So this, uh, there's this book from FAO, which the title says so much, more people, more food, worse water. So we need to feed uh, more people, we need more uh, more fruits, uh, more um, food, but this generates environmental issues. So the question is, in all these decades, we have been increasing the input of nitrate to our system too. So where, where does all this nitrate go? There is this study for ASCOT et al. 2017, where it shows like a, in, in a globe, it's a global study, how from 1925 up to 2000, if you see like here, this sequence of uh, different maps, the nitrate has been, or nitrogen has been stored in the soil. And this is clearly here, if you see the last uh, picture in 2000, uh, in US, Europe, and Asia, uh, this has been critical. There's a critical increase of nitrate. And here, if we look at the global trend also, uh, we will see the same. So it's a problem that has been growing for decades. And yeah, the, the, the answer is just is stored in the soil. Um, so now that we know that in the soil, we have like a um, a pool of nitrogen. How is this? How how is then transported? Is um, then we see hydrology start playing a role. We have seen in this uh, Puget at all uh, study. We will see that, for example, one drop of rainfall that uh, touch the soil will have different trajectories until it uh, it um, goes to the outlet of the catchment or to the stream. This can take days, years, decades, uh, or longer period. In this other study here, they, uh, using a very simplified uh, method, they estimated the median transit times of the catchment. So uh, if you average uh, all the possible locations where a rainfall drop falls, how long it will take to go to the outlet of a catchment. And, and you, you can see here the, in the color map, this is Germany and this is France. Uh, if we look at here in the mode of transit times, five, more or less five years is the, is the average time. So we are, we are, we are uh, saying that we want to implement policies to prevent a, a increase in nitrate, but this is taking so long, uh, five years. You will see results in, in many years, depending on the catchment. But also uh, in the same study, they wanted to see, okay, what is the median transit time, but also how much nit nitrogen or nitrate is retained. So uh, the, the deficit that you see from the input to the output. And you see here that this deficit, the median value, if we go to this plot here uh, below, this is transit time versus retention. The median value is 75%. So 75% of the inputs are retained by the catchment. It uh, can be retained in the soil, but also uh, in the stream, there are also processes that uh, remove nitrate. And they wanted to say, they, 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 uh, then they raised the question, 
if we have like catchments with very short transit times, so very fast uh, release of the water, why can why do we still have so much retention? For example, all this catchment here, very short transit time, steeper catchments where water flows very fast. Why? Uh, how can we retain if the pathways are so short? How can we retain so much? And then it's because it's not only uh, groundwater retention; it's also biogeochemical retention. So the soil can also capture uh, nitrogen in organic ways and store this nitrate in the soil. So the, comp the, the problem is much more complex. But okay, but if we go like uh, more in detail to the topic, uh, my topic is in Germany. Um, if we compare Germany to the other countries of the uh, European community, it's doing very bad. Germany in, in this uh, example, um, is the second worst country in terms of like um, the average water bodies exceeding the threshold of 50 milli milligrams per liter. So uh, it has to do much more. It, ha it has done so far, but the results are not, uh, it, because of this delay in the responses could be that uh, we don't see fast um, improvements. So this is another map of the eutrophic status. So also um, related to the excess of nutrients. And here the blue color show that the state is very bad, like 40 to 80% uh, in, in a bad uh, water quality condition. And if we think why we have this situation in Germany, it's uh, the first thing would be it's agriculture, the first uh, reason. So um, Germany, well, if you look around here, I live around this place. It's all covered by agriculture. There are catchments that has uh, more than 60% or 80% of uh, agriculture land use. It's, uh, it's, it's very intense, intense agriculture development in this, uh, in this region. And therefore, you, we have the, the issues that I'm showing. So, uh, but between nutrients, I, I'm talking more about nitrogen, but uh, there's also phosphorus and carbon, part of the, the, the main nutrients for, for the problem of uh, eutrophication, for example. And if we locate all the catchments or all the monitoring stations from Germany in this tenary plot, we will see that the majority of the catchment will be in this corner. This is a tenary plot. So these corners, means that we have an excess of nit nitrogen compared to carbon and, and phosphorus. So yes, nitrate, nitrate is uh, the main issue in terms of nutrients. I hope I could convince you about this. So then, how do we study the, this nitrate pollution in rivers? And here we come with, uh, with a method that uh, is not so complex. The, um, Probably some of you have heard about this, the CQ analysis. So C, concentration, and Q, discharge or stream flow. So if we analyze, a cut, in, in this example from this paper, Musso 2015, there are three examples, three different catchments, where you see at the outlet of the catchment, the time series of discharge, which are these lines here. But if you plot the discharge, um, in the x axis and the concentrations in the in the y axis you can have this behavior for example this behavior is called enrichment or positive uh, relationship between discharge and concentrations meaning that with more discharge we will be transporting more and more and more nitrate like if we would have like an infinite pool of nitrate in the soil but other catchments show different behaviors. For example, this one show no relationship, I would say. And this other one, a uh, um, negative slope called dilution. So what, and the way to analyze this uh, typically is to use log scale. So log C versus log Q, and you, you can fit a linear regression with the, in, the, in the other spaces is a power law. And then we will have different export patterns. So these uh, slopes here. 
but at the same time, you see different levels of variability in, 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 in the access for different catchments. Again, transport versus reaction. Now we go again, but now with this CQ focus. And in this paper, uh, CN Lee, what he hypothesized is that in agricultural catchments, if, if you have like a, a soil very rich in nitrate because of the excess of fertilizers, then the fluctuations of the, of the water level, for example, in winter with rays, and you will be connecting more uh, the contaminated soil. So you will have like a flushing effect or enrichment, this positive relationship. This is one hypothesis based only in, in transport and, the and, and, and also a given profile of uh, nitrogen pollution in the soil. But then also we have the reaction part. So in the reaction part, uh, I already, said say, um, that we have mainly two uh, processes of reaction, important reaction, ones are occurring in the soil and the other one in the stream. So in-stream processes, removal within the, the river um, by uh, microbial activity or al al algae uh, can be very important in some systems, in other not so important. But in, uh, also in the soil, we will have like uh, one very important process, which is denitrification. Denitrification increase. So this is here, I showed here. Denitrification will convert this uh, nitrate uh, in, to gauge uh, to N, N2 and release to the atmosphere. So then the problem is solved. We could say not really, but, uh, but this gas is not... Uh, doesn't damage the, the environment. So it, we would prefer to have like this process more abundant. But also there's another process in the soil that I didn't explain. And it's uh, about having this uh, nitrogen in the soil. If we would have like nitrate in the soil, this would be flushed immediately because it's highly soluble in water. So the re in reality, uh, nitrogen is stored in the soil as organic nitrogen. And we need uh, a few reactions uh, to convert to inorganic nitrate and then to flush it. And for, for these conditions, normally we need some moisture uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the environment. So in this um, paper from Motar 2017, they did this CQ uh, analysis but uh, in a segmented uh, linear regression, not, not only one linear regression, they divide it into in, in Q50, one slope for the low flow and one slope for the high flow. And in the low flow, they, they noticed that the slope can be steeper. So meaning that uh, with very, very low flow, you can have like very low concentration because of biogeochemical retention because for, uh, for in-stream in -stream process, for example, because if you have like lower flow, you, you will have also lower velocities, longer uh, residence time, which are um, positive for this um, biogeochemical removal of nitrate. So in summary, the sources, we know uh, it's not nitrogen in soil accumulated for decades of like excessive um, fertilizer usage. We know that if we have more agriculture, we will have more input, nitrogen input from the biogeochemical process. We know that there's a removal in the soil, but also in the stream. And also another uh, process is mineralization, how like the organic nitrogen that is applied in fertilizer fertilizer normally is an organic molecule, like a urea, for instance, uh, it has to be transformed to inorganic to be transported. And the time of this process is highly uncertain. And finally, we have like the hydrological transport, all the dynamics that hydrology provides to the catchment during wet and dry periods, how this interact with these other two processes, uh, these other two um, end to see our signal in the outlet. This is more or less the problem.
So now I will switch to my first topic that I have done in, in the PhD about runoff events. So uh, during runoff events, we can have like a precipitation event that then uh, in the outlet we will see like a, a peak discharge. So a an hydrograph and uh, researchers from different parts of the world have, have examined, have check this uh, issue with high frequency data, so sub-daily uh, values. And they have found that in some cases, during these runoff events, you have like a, an increase in the nitrate concentration. But in other cases, you have like the, the opposite, a dilution, so a, a decrease in nitrate concentration. For example, in, in this paper from Schwintek 2013 in Germany, one catchment, in the same catchment, for different events, you, you find the opposite behavior. In this case, it's increasing the nitrate concentration. In this one, you can see here clearly the peak, but in this other event, it's the opposite. You see like a, a decrease in, in nitrate during this run of events. So why do we have different behaviors? Then I, I will show the results of these two papers that are very important for, or the main motivation of my first work. So first is uh, Minaudo et al. 2019. Um, they using low frequency data, meaning bi-weekly to monthly samples only. So very, very raw data. Um, they, they found that during runoff events, the data was uh, has another pattern that during uh, no runoff events or between events, let's say. And in, in, for example, in this plot, this is one catchment in France, and they were asking why in point, this is nitrate and in X axis you have discharge, why in, in this point A and this point B, you have the same level of discharge. So uh, more or less the catchment uh, is responding in the same way in term, in, in, in hydrolo hydrological point of view, we could say, only based on discharge. Why do we have like such a different uh, concentration in nitrate? And then another study, this is from NAP et al. 2020 in one single catchment, but with high frequency data. So sub daily samples, they were measuring all the time, different compounds. And they found that if you take like the, the long term, all the data and you fit a CQ line, for example, let's see nitrate immediately here. If you, if you take this, uh, you will see that there's a clear dilution pattern. So more discharge, you have less concentration. But if you see the individual color lines, each line represents samples taken during a different run of event. And they, uh, and they have completely the opposite pattern. So during the event, you have like this enrichment or more mobilization compared to the other pattern. So, we, we, our hypothesis is that uh, runoff events can produce scattering in this long-term relationship. This is one example that, uh, that this can be one of the reasons why this CQ relationship had uh, variability. We wanted to try this in our catchments. Here I have one example of a Yerman River catchment. The black line is the discharge time series. And the point, the dots are graph samples taken bi-weekly. And, um, and if you see, there's a, a seasonal pattern also in the nitrate uh, signal. But if you look at here, at the CQ relationship, again, we have for same, for same levels of uh, discharge, different responses. So we decided to use this CQ relationship, this a dot line here, which is a linear regression with all the data as a reference to compare why some, some samples are located here below and why some samples are located at the other side of the, of the line. So let's say the deviation. We want to say the deviation, why, why samples deviate in some direction and why, why others in other. And the question is, can runoff event ex explain this scatter in this CQ relationship? So to do that, we compute for 184 catchments. We took all the time series uh, from, 2000, from 2000 to 2015. 
and we compute uh, for each catchment the long-term CQ relationship, this uh, line here. And then we obtain the residuals of each grab sample. And then each grab sample, we define if it was taken during a runoff event or not. And for those that they were taken during runoff events, we classified them according to the nature of the runoff event. For that, uh, we use um, a, a classification runoff classification framework developed by Terasoa 2020, uh, which classify runoff events based on the inducing event, if it was rainfall, rain on snow, or a mixture of rainfall and snow melt. Uh, my, Majority of the events were produced by rainfall, so then those were also um, subclassified according to the wetness state, if it was wet or dry, the, the soil antecedent conditions. And also for the dry ones, we, we checked the spatial distribution of moisture, if it was like uniformly dry or if there were some patch uh, of moisture, so patchy, this was based, this is based in the spatial variability of moisture. And then uh, those are the main results. We checked here the, these deviations that we were saying, and here we see with uh, blue or green colors, positive deviations and with brown colors, negative deviations. So for these events, rain on snow and mixture events that I will call it now snow impacted events, most of the catchments presented show a positive relation, a positive deviations, meaning much more nitrate transport during these events compared to the long-term pattern. And then for rain dry events, rain dry patchy and rain dry uniform, the opposite. So this um, during these dry conditions, concentration of nitrate decreased below the, the CQ pattern or the long-term CQ relationship, this, this line of reference that I'm using. So why, uh, why, how can we explain this? Looking at different uh, characteristics of these events, we ended uh, with the conclusion that we can explain this deviation based on the level of hydrological or hydrologic connectivity. We measure as a proxy of hydrologic connectivity, the runoff event coefficient, so the fraction of quick flow and, and base flow of the event, meaning that uh, if, if the random coefficient is higher, uh, more of the, the response of the catchment will be with much more water compared to base flow. And this, this, is, this can be signal that the catchment is much well connected. So hill slopes are more, con more connected to, to the stream. And we see this clear positive relationship here for higher levels of hydrological connectivity compared to, uh, to the deviation. So we ended at, uh, with these conclusions. First, snow impacted events produce this increase in nitrate mobilization, which has like a strong implications because um, these events are also the, the bigger events in terms of levels of discharge. So the load, meaning the concentration multiplied by discharge, so the mass, Transport is very high and is very risky for coastal environments, for example. Instead, rain on dry produce the opposite, so lower concentrations. And this we explain with hydrological connectivity. So when, when it's very dry, uh, all the only few pathways are connected to the stream. Only the ones, uh, maybe the land that is very close to the river is connected to the stream. And normally also, in addition, we have the, the effect of the riparian zones that normally don't have agriculture and also have a lot of um, organic matter that can even reduce this. So hydrology is controlling much more this, uh, this connection or this connectivity, these uh, pathways that at the same time have an interplay with these bi bi uh, biochemical processes. I compare also these responses with different catchment characteristics, and, and we found that the, the flatter catchments with buffer capacity, uh, which means like deep uh, soils and 
maybe some some properties of the of the soil that are positive for denitrification so with but with capacity of remove nitrate in this catchment the the deviations during during snow impacted events was much higher so they there's a higher risk in these catchments to have like unexpected high nitrate concentration so the second topic and um, if, if there's no question of clarity, uh, Nico, I can continue. Okay. So I can I will continue now with the second topic that I'm working is about droughts, hydrological droughts. But first, to, to understand this, I put this slide about what has been done in terms of exploring the internal variability of nitrate. This is a study of US of Simha and Michalak 2016. And they, uh, with a with a model, they found that the drivers of spatial variability in U.S. of nitrate nitrate loads uh, was because of the application of fertilizers. So the NANI, they call it net anthropogenic nitrogen input. So basically, if we put more or less nitrogen in the soil, this will uh, this drive this uh, spatial variability that, that we observe in US in stream water. And also the interannual variability, so how much variable is in, in time and year to year, uh, it's, it's driven by in, mostly by climatic conditions, so precipitation. And also they, they analyze what is driving the extreme loading in certain years and, and also climatic conditions is playing a, a, a very strong role. So anthropogenic plus climatic drive the this interannual variability across catchments in US. But if they were using a model and, and they advise here that um, transitions from dry to wet are difficult to represent. So they, they just put this warning here that I, I, I take it to apply to my research that I will mention in the next slide. So droughts, why are important droughts? Well, we have climate change and it's already stated that in Europe, uh, droughts will increase in terms of duration, uh, frequency, and also the extension, the cover area. Uh, but what do we know that how droughts affect uh, the transport of nutrients in catchments? There's this uh, review paper from Mosley et al. 2015. He took like different papers checking the effect during droughts of nutrients. And if you look at here in the bar plot, there, there are mixed of responses. So some catchments or some study sites decrease the concentration of nutrients and some others increase. Very difficult to understand. So what did they say about, about this? They were saying that um, depending on the sources, if it's point sources, for example, like wait, was the, um, waste water, for, um, if you have less water because of the drought, you will have less dilution. And then you will have like an increase in, in nitrate concentration. Instead, if your main source is agriculture, so a diffuse source, if you have less water, you will have less hydrological connectivity, and then you will the river will not be connected to, to the land, and concentration can decrease. So, but uh, one thing is what is the effect of drought in the nitrate dynamics, but another another thing that I wanted to analyze is what happened after drought. I found this paper, and there are some others that state that during droughts, there's um, plants cannot take the nitrate of the fertilizer. And then when you have like in, in the next wet conditions, you can transfer all this nitrate and you can have like a flash of nitrate after drought. So this would be like the post drought effect. I wanted to check this and I, I checked this paper from FAMMETER uh, et al. 2016 in US. And they found the same from one year to the other. Uh, these dots, red dots or orange with the black point, 
they show like a, an anomalous increase in nitrate concentration, and they attributed this um, to the pres to the clim climatic conditions. So the year the year after the drought was wet in this part, these blue zones here, but also. Uh, this, these zones have more agriculture than these other zones here, for example, that they have exactly the same climatic condition, but not this nitrate flash. So they said it's the combination of climate and land use again. So I wanted to check this for Yerman catchments. Here we have an example. This is the um, one, one, one catchment. Colors are the seasons. Winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Uh, we can take a look in the blue dots that are winter. But we, here we know that in, in winter we will have like wetter conditions, so enough moisture to, to transport. And the crosses here show like post droughts. And we see that these crosses in blue, but also in, in orange in autumn uh, are very, very high. So it could be possible that uh, after drought, we see the same effect in, in German catchments. And on the contrary, uh, if you look at the triangles, which are droughts, here we have, we in the red points in summer, we see very low nitrate concentration. And also here in some, some triangles um, in blue. So the hypothesis is that nitrate concentrations in stream decrease systematically during drought. And after drought, they will increase uh, due to this post-drought effect um, in German catchments. So we wanted to check this. Uh, well, as I, as I said, I'm working with low frequency data. So bi-weekly to monthly uh, graph samples. Is, um, to extend this data, I did trend it. I also showed that after 90s, after implementation of policies, the nitrate concentration start declining uh, because of these policies. So I removed this trend using a SP line fit, and I work on the residuals of this uh, time series. So this was uh, step one to extend the length of the data. Step two, I also wanted to remove the seasonality of the data. So I compute like a um, moving window of 365 days. So this is one example. The orange line are all, always the same values. So, and, and then I will work with these anomalies here compared to this seasonal pattern, which is uh, written here in this formula. So after this second step, the time series will look something like this. And the third step is we will classify the, according to the hydrological conditions in terms of droughts. We have to we have to define what is a drought. There are different definitions in the um, literature. I picked this one from Bruna et al. 2021. So basically, you first smooth the time series with a moving window um, of 30 days, and then you compute like a, a variable threshold, which will be the 20th lowest percentile of discharge for each day of the long time series, which is this line here. So every year will be the same the, the same threshold. So it's one value of threshold for each day of the, calendar, of the calendar year. And then if the discharge is below this threshold, it will be considered a drought, like this small red periods. But we in this study, we consider, uh, as well as in, other, in, in the original study, we consider that um, the minimum length of a drought will be 30 days. And then we took um, 90 days after the drought as a period of the post drought to, to explore if we see this flash of nitrate. This can be arbitrary. I tried different ones. And I, it, this is more based on data availability, the criteria. So this, these are the results during droughts uh, in spring, summer, and autumn. The majority of the catchments show a decrease in nitrate concentration. Here I'm showing in, in the map, if you, if you see here, these three plots, each dot, the size of the dot, show how many samples I have 
to compute the median value. And the median value is showed with the color, color scale, meaning that blue colors, low nitrate concentration compared to the average of the season and high uh, values uh, are in red. So in these three seasons, spring, summer, and autumn during drought conditions, most of the points are blue in this case. And the black border here shows a statist statistically uh, difference using Kruskal Wallis test compared to no drought conditions, which are shown in the top. So, uh, so this follows the hypothesis that we will have like a decrease in nitrate concentration in our catchments. But in winter, we see like a spatial pattern. So in the south, the, the dots are red. So you have an increase in nitrate concentration. In the south, I'm sorry, and in the north, the opposite, uh, a decrease in nitrate concentration. So, and then during post drought, so the panel here uh, at the end, I will only talk about the winter post drought. So this panel here, we see that uh, most of the colors are red. Not all are significantly different compared to no drought, but uh, we still can see the, the post-drought flash effect that we were hypothesizing here. So uh, we wanted to see the risk because one thing is these are the medium, medium values, but remember that we are taking a window of 90 days. So in these 90 days, we, we, we will have like dif uh, different conditions. So I wanted to, to check the risk of having, having a high nitrate concentration after drought. And I ended with this analysis. So in this analysis, I plot the risk or the increase or decrease in risk of having concentrations above the 75 percentile. So I basically what I did is I took the 20, I mean, the highest 25 percentile of the samples and I count, uh, how, what is the proportion? If I take all data, we will have like a risk of 0 0.25. So uh, this is like the, the baseline. And from this, how much increase the risk in no drought conditions, drought and post drought conditions. And you can clearly see here that uh, most of the dots here, in at least in the West of Germany and in the South are red. So there is an increase in the risk of having like a nitrate flash due to post-drought conditions. In here, the bar plot, the, the bar plot show the same. So post in, on average, if you take like the median value of all this catchment, there's an increase of 33% uh, of the risk. We also have this risk increase in drought due in the south of Germany. And this is uh, the main result. So some key messages from this, uh, this part, droughts generally decrease the nitrate uh, concentration due to disconnection of agricultural soils. In, in winter drought, these southern catchments that has more higher concentrations uh, are due to, because they have like, they are more humid, more, uh, but at the same time, there's less agriculture in this zone in the south. And um, because of no lack of dilution, because of the lack of dilution, you will have like an increase in nitrate. And these catchments, because they are not so much agriculture, they will not have this uh, enrichment effect. So if you have dry, um, drier conditions, you will be uh, you you will not be connecting, for example, forests that forests that are like typically in the high part of the catchment. And then you will have like an increase in the in the nitrate concentration because forests uh, are, are not rich in nitrate. Uh, they don't uh, release so much nitrate compared to an agriculture catchment. And the other key message is uh, that the post drought period in winter increase in, in nitrate in several catchments. Uh, but it's more clear this fact when we look at the risk with our, an, on a median value of increase of the risk of 33%. I still work on this data. There are differences in each system also, but uh, so far those are my results, positive results, uh, I would say. And so I already have been talking 45 minutes. I will give just three um, final comments about this. First is the value of low frequency data. 
Now, often uh, we have more and more high frequency data in Europe and in US and in other countries too. And this is very important to look at in detail each process, but low frequency data are normally available in these uh, monitoring campaigns from the authorities for, from different countries. And this can be uh, useful for, to, to do this type of analysis. And so it's possible to extend to other regions. Uh, so it's a message uh, for, for, there are more opportunities to do more research on this, maybe also in Chile. And then uh, also with the same kind of studies, we can extend to other pollutants. Uh, here also it's important phosphate, it's a, a for eutrophication, but also now it's, a, there's people here in my institute working on microplastic, for example. And they also, I mean, these type of methods, they, they can also be useful for that. And then climate change impact. What can we say about this? Like in climate change in this region, you, we will have more droughts, uh, less snow, maybe nitrate concentration will decrease, but we always have the risk of what will happen after a drought, for example, post drought effect. So with that, I end and I would be happy to answer any questions. And here are all the references. Uh, thanks again, Nico and, and Pablo for the invitation. Thanks, Felipe, for your presentation. Um, I would like to remind the audience what you, what you just said. If you have any question in Spanish or English, just write it in the chat and we can uh, translate it for you if it's, if it's in Spanish. Um, I don't know if uh, Dr. Pablo Mendoza uh, has questions, because I do, so. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Nico, and also, uh, hi, people, very nice to see you, and, and it's very nice to see how much progress you have made over the past three years, it's a lot of work. Uh, we, we, can, we can really see it, so it, it's very nice to see how things are, are, are uh, coming together. Um, so uh, I do have a lot of questions, but I will start with a relatively simple one. At some point you were trying to explain the di different departures from the curve, from the uh, uh, concentration strength of curve, using uh, hydrological signatures. Uh, can you please elaborate on, on that idea and explain if you're planning to use uh, other signatures than, uh, than the ones that you were mentioning, like base low index, for instance, of the event runoff coefficient? Yeah, yeah exactly. I, I ended with run, runoff coefficient, but yes, there, there were more that could also explain this. Um, I, I ended with runoff coefficient because um, it's it has like a, a, a logical way of uh, explaining this a concept of hydrologic connectivity, but for example, soil moisture, it, it, it would also work for uh, in this case. And what I was looking was like the, okay, we saw these differences between this type of runoff events, which features between this type of runoff events are more like, uh, are mm -hmm. statistically different. And uh, applying these tests, Runoff coefficient was the one with a high, uh, with the most significance in terms of differences between types mm -hmm. of runoff events. So this was the the final criteria. But yes, for example, I tried. I didn't try with soil and base flow index. Ah, but you're you're talking hydrological signature, signatures in terms of catchment or in terms of uh, runoff events. I'm sorry. Uh, could both. No, I, uh, yeah, uh, so what I explained is what, what I did in terms, in, in this regard, uh, checking be between event types, but for the catchment uh, descriptors to check like um, topography was a, uh, where in, in land use, I, in this phenomena is always uh, much stronger than, than, than I don't know, uh, base flow index. However, there's a high correlation always between all, all I mean, mm -hmm. topographic uh, descriptors are often also correlated with base flow index and, and uh, precipitation and others it's in Germany, in this, uh, in, in, yeah. In... 
thanks Felipe for the answer. Uh, also, it, it looks like uh, all this work is being made with observed observe data. Is yes. that correct? So uh, have you thought at some point to use model data in order to, um, I don't know, to, to go deeper into possible connections be between uh, nitrate mobilization and hydrological yes. processes in your catchments? Yes, uh, this is a very good point. Um, I would say from the modeling perspective, um, well, in nowadays, at least modeling discharge, um, it's always possible and you always have a good uh, fit for modeling uh, the concentration of nitrate is not so easy because you uh, you often don't have the input so you don't you, you really don't know how much nit uh, nitrate farmers apply there's only information mm. nowadays at a yearly scale so uh, based on the market of fertilizers so you have like and you you really need this input to to model there are some catchments where you have this information like in more detail and there are models that do the work very good. Like in here in UFZ, you have like the, you know, the MHM model from hydrology. Now they have the MQM model, which I, they start modeling nitrate with very good results and explaining their processes. So, uh, but this is for single catchments, uh, which enough data. And so we cannot extend so far this uh, modeling probably they will do uh, sooner or later, uh, but so far we cannot extend to this number of catchment. Uh, yeah, so this is at, at this scale. So annual mo uh, modeling could be possible. There, there, is, there is a paper also uh, from people from Leipzig here that they, they were doing this, but for runoff events, uh, I haven't seen, uh, but, and for droughts, there, there are also some papers using modeling where they, they show that uh, this accumulation of nitrate in the soil during the drought uh, is real. The model is also telling this. And this is what I use also as an argument for, for explaining what I see in this uh, post-drought flash. Uh, because I can only based on data, it's difficult to, to quantify uh, in a certain way, like uh, which, how how much of this flash of nitrate it's come exactly because of the accumulation during the drought? Uh, I can only I, I, um, discuss about this, but uh, so far I don't have like the the tools like, or modeling tools to to quantify like in, in a certain way. So yeah, it might be my PhD project is uh, about large scale analysis, data analysis. Um, so modeling is not uh, part of the project so far, uh, but the idea is also always uh, do data analysis, taking into consideration what we know, or what the new knowledge that comes from modeling or the new knowledge that comes from high frequency analysis. And this is what I, what I have been doing so far. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, I don't have uh, further questions for the moment. Nico, thanks. Okay, so um, there are three questions uh, by Julio. So thanks, Julio, for your questions. Um, uh, the, the questions are in Spanish, so I'm, I'm going to translate it. Uh, so the first one is, if you know the information from the Chilean Water Directorate, um, and if it's possible to carry out the same analysis that you are doing here in Chile. It's a, a very nice question. Yes, I'm, I'm, I, I'm looking forward to do it, to, to analyze this data. Uh, we have discussed uh, in the past uh, about having maybe some students doing this analysis. Uh, of course, the, the data we have in Chile is less frequent than in Germany. So we still have some uh, this monitoring campaigns from DGA, uh, nitrate is, um, is measured in in our rivers, and yeah, and actually I I had the database. We I think this is this is going on slowly, but uh, yeah, it, it it will happen. Uh, 
sooner or later. <laughs> I, when I find the time, maybe, or if I find a student maybe interested in doing this type of analysis, this, that that was was also something that I wanted to to say in this uh, seminar. Like, uh, yeah, the opportunities to do similar things in Chile, I think they are. There will be limitations because the the frequency of the data will be different and probably the extension the, the time span of the data also uh, i know that there is data there's there there uh, low frequency not only for surface water also for groundwater and uh, yeah it would be i would be very interested in do something with this data some analysis Great. Um, well, Diego Soto is also, also watching the, the webinar. Uh, he says a very inter interesting explanation and presentation. Um, the second question is, uh, as a part of your work, are you going to recommend uh, how, when, and where uh, are more nitrate measurements necessary? How? <laughs> this is a, this is, this question yeah, this is a very difficult. Uh, how, when, and where? Oh, when and where? Yeah, I'm. I think uh, definitely where, somewhere that you are also measuring discharge. This is something that uh, I, 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 I mean, in, in Germany we had this issue that we have many, many, many monitoring uh, water quality stations that don't have discharge, and they are so correlated as we, as as we saw with the CQ relationships. That yeah, definitely uh, it's good to have discharge. But if we don't, we can. You can use also some modeling, as uh, Pablo was suggesting, was saying uh, before. So how frequent? Uh, at least for this type of analysis, it was uh, good to have like biweekly, biweekly samples. This is uh, depending on, on what you want to analyze. But if you wanna analyze. Uh, if you want to analyze runoff events, I would go of, in a particular site. I would go for high frequency data because the, there, there's then, then you can really understand the process. We are we are talking now about like doing research. You know? So with this purpose, uh, so for this purpose, I, I I would suggest to go with high frequency. To yeah, there are as I, I show in one picture within us. Same locations, we can find different uh, di different behaviors, hysteresis uh, patterns, we, we call it, and, and are very difficult to, um, to understand. I, I'm also collaborating in another paper about these high frequency relationships, and, uh, and it's, it's growing a lot. Uh, there's so much that you can derive from this information, from sources, closer sources, or like, uh, if the sources come from far away in the catchment, like up, up, uh, upslope or, or close to the river, only based in data analysis. And uh, for the, and, and I, uh, I would say that uh, a good amount of, um, yeah, it, it's difficult to say, to, to say like a, a number, like for me, by weekly, you can have like a clear idea. Uh, but it will depend a lot on the variability of the concentration within the catchment. If it's a catchment that uh, doesn't vary at all, uh, you would not need uh, these uh, so frequent measurements. For research, of course, we would like to have it every minute. But yeah, but but this will have a cost, of course. So I, I don't have a, a, a clear answer to this question. I have to. I admit. Okay, and the third question is. Do you know if there is or there are any German authorities uh, working to reduce or control this nitrate problem? Yeah, I mean, there's a whole uh, European effort, I would say, uh, to, to deal with this issue. Like, uh, I mean, uh, my PhD is part of this effort. Uh, it's, it's money coming from the government to this, to you have said, uh, and there are, there are different institutions uh, doing research on this to improve from different perspective. We are doing more like the understanding, like a trying, there are a lot of efforts in mitigations also in policies. And so uh, I see like in the different institutions of Germany, they, 
there are many focus on on this issue. This is a very big issue because uh, they they set up this um, threshold of the water quality, and they are not uh, they are they are not um, below the threshold. So so they 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 really want to improve this, and this and it's a big issue that uh, difficult to to address. But you see, yeah, there, there are developments also uh, in how farms have, uh, farm management also very important. All you in this picture of Netherlands, uh, this protest, they they have implemented many different. Uh, for example, I, I was looking one one measure. One measure was uh, to cover the crops. Uh, you put like plastic in the crops, so when it rains. It doesn't wash the the nitrate that it's stored just below the root zone, so things like this are are being applied. So you can imagine like a, and so yes, it's a I I would say is one of the main environmental issues nowadays in Europe, and in in US also it's a it's a big issue and in China too. Okay, thank you. I have two uh, questions. Uh... The first one is when you uh, showed a plot comparing the uh, nitrate concentration with the uh, uh, the dryness of the catchment or the stream flow um, response, th there was a this very uh, clear re relationship between the nitrate concentration and the stream flow. But with higher with higher stream flow, the dispersion is larger. Yes. So, uh, do you have any idea or theory uh, that could explain that dispersion or increasing the dispersion with increasing a stream flow? Increasing the dispersion when increase the uh, discharge. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, this is catchment by catchment. I have seen many catchments with the opposite behavior, like uh, much more dispersion in the low part of the of the concentration. I would say that I see more often this pattern actually, like uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, in the drought one, I, I I know which one you are you are mentioning. Uh, yeah, it's it's the other way around, but yeah, these dispersions. I mean, this is this was the the topic for for the first one. Like, look, where are the possible? There are many. One is the runoff events. This dynamics during runoff events. It's not the same. All uh, depend on the event, but if you are in the racing limb or in the peak or in the falling limb, uh, some catchment will have like a different behavior, like a delay in the response, for example. Uh, so this can play a role. I showed that in in the first package, it was not important for the deviation of the CQ relationship, but this could be uh, in terms of concentration could make a role as I, I as we saw with high frequency data. There's another another possibility that uh, you have like fertilizer application period. In Germany is uh, prohibited to apply, for example, in winter. But in, in the rest of the year, uh, you don't really know when farmers are applying and how much are applying, or if it rained, uh, how long time ago the, the farmer applied the fertilizer or not. We know that in the soil is full of fertilizer. But the fast, the, the very fast path uh, pathways to the river can transport very high amounts of nitrate that was just recently applied. This could all uh, this has been shown in in some high frequency data, and, but with the low frequency data, we cannot analyze this phenomenon because it's uh, just too coarse data. And so this is also another option of how um, this variability can be, like the time of application of fertilizer. The, um, the runoff events, the also some climatic conditions uh, or conditions of the in-stream processes. If it, the temperature, for example, uh, was like favorable, uh, positive um, for for the uptake uh, of some microorganisms, this could also add some, and of course, uh, some point sources that can always that you cannot control that. Uh, Punctual sources that will just flow to the river, like in some just before you took the sample, or who knows, or like you, you also have this variability plus all the variability that you that you can get from 
just the fact of taking the sample and the lab process, et cetera. Th those Thank would you. be the ones that come to my mind now. Hmm. Thank you. And my uh, second and final question is related to the post drought effect. And this is just uh, my mind talking. Uh, I, I was wondering if you uh, perform the same uh, uh, analysis in a, let's say, a, a Mediterranean catch catchment with a very, with, because the, the Mediterranean catchment have, has have a very strong seasonality. Exactly. Have a very short period of, of rain yes. and then a very long dry period. Yes. Um, uh, could it be possible to I don't know, derive some theories with the, using this post drought effect in this uh, catchment with a very strong seasonality, with, which everything is almost, I mean, let's also almost define. I mean, the wet period is defined. Uh, yes. the, probably the, the fertilizers are applied during, I don't know, spring. And you have probably yeah. more control. Uh, yeah. in, in this uh, type of catchments, this strong seasonality means like there is a strong uh, connection and this connection between the the farms and the rivers so uh, if we but at the same time uh, yeah the, the the dynamics could change a little bit and here the unknown part from my side is that um, the, the nitrate is stored in the soil as a organic form. So an organic form is very stable. And if, if it rains, for example, and you have like a nitrogen in an organic form, this will not necessarily be, be flushed or be transported. This can also be attached to the soil. So you need uh, this process of mineralization where you need some moisture first to, I think it would be interesting in, interesting to, to analyze this, but, but I, I, here we always have some moisture. In autumn, for example, uh, we have moisture that we, we would expect that the mineralization processes occur and, and, and then you have like the strong connection and you have this flush. This could be different uh, in, in a Mediterranean catchment, this part, but I, 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 I could not. Nitrate would be anyways, uh, the, the the process of being of dry conditions and plants not taking the nitrate because it's too dry this will happen also so you will still have this uh, nitrate or nitrogen in in the soil and and then uh, yeah this could, I think I think it, it it could also happen maybe with a, a longer delay not uh, this maybe my my simplified method of just taking the drought ended and now I considered certain amount of days after to, to measure this uh, effect. Maybe this would not be uh, accurate in this type and we, sh we should like uh, fix the method according to the conditions. But, but so th this, this I think it could be different, but I, but I think that uh, it also could happen. Uh, thank you. Um... Very there are question. no more questions. Uh, so I would like to thank you again, Felipe, for uh, accepting the invitation. This is the last webinar of the of our spring semester here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, so we're very, very glad to have you here with us. Mm -hmm. you no, know, I, I want to thank you, of course, and Paolo and all the, the, the people who, may, who attended and also asked questions. Thanks, Diego, for, for saying hi also. And yeah, and, and happy for the invitation. I'm very, very happy. I'm looking forward to see you again in Chile. And thanks again. Great. So uh, thanks to the audience uh, watching the webinar. And well, have a good day and see you in the next.